Please join me in welcoming Dr. Greg, Greg Nenna. Thanks, Mary. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Mary, for that uh, kind introduction. Um, it's great to be up here, but it's also great to see so many of you here interested in these topics, and the breadth of the topics of the morning is really impressive to me, because I think that's a really important part of, of dealing with climate change, of how, how many impacts there are and how many potential solutions there are. So as Mary said, I'm here to talk about my book project, and this is a new thing for me. I've never written a book before, and until recently, I'd never given a talk about a book before. <laughs> um, I gave one a couple months ago in China, that was the first one, and then I gave one in Saudi Arabia last month. So this is a much more familiar territory for me. Um, but I did realize that talking about a book-length project where I'm talking with 60 or 70 interviews of people around the world, it's really hard. So I'm trying to get better at, um, at fitting in and getting to the important points. So that's really kind of my challenge today is uh, to kind of convey what I'm doing. And I wanted to really talk about three things. One is the motivation, so why I'm working on this project. Um, a second one is to give you a preliminary answer to the question that's on this slide there. So what would I think so far? Um, and then ultimately what this work is really meant to do is to provide a model for other changes, behavioral changes, technological changes that we could do, learning from uh, a technology and an effort that really worked. And that really is my motivation for working on solar and doing a book about it. One, as a social scientist, it's been a fascinating, interesting story. There's so many parts to it. Um, but also as a citizen, it's really, a, it's a happy, successful story. It's really amazing what's been done over a pretty long period of time. So that's kind of what I want to uh, describe to you today. So first of all, to introduce what has really made this a fun and pleasurable project rather than a burdensome one is to have a great team of students that work with me, people in the top row um, conducting research on the bottom row, helping me do interviews in China, and then most recently on the bottom row there is um, it, together installing a solar system uh, myself to understand a bit about how, how it works and some of the peculiarities to it. And that, that's really been insightful to me to actually do some hands-on work with it. So these, these people have been great. So I'll start out with a slide that I usually hope that I don't need to present, and certainly at this uh, group I don't, but I try to fly my colors because in some groups I do have to make this case and then justify it. So that's where I, where I am to start with. Um, but there's this other part of it, and this comes from working in public policy and working on societal issues where there's competing demands on people's attention. And that's a big challenge with climate change. And even within energy, there's more than one aspect of it. And so that's partly what makes dealing with climate change difficult, I think. So I call it the iron law of energy policy, is that policymaking always involves multiple objectives. So we want energy that is cheap, so we don't want gasoline to cost $5 a gallon. We'd prefer it to cost $1 or $2 a gallon. Cheap means different things to different people. So there's a bit more than 2 billion people in the world that still use traditional biomass as their main energy source. And there's a little bit less than 2 million people in the world that don't have access to electricity. And so having access to energy means something really important for uh, about a third of the world's population. We want energy that's clean, so we can talk about climate change here but also air pollution, which is clean in a different way because its impacts are, tend to be more local and more immediate and more directly tied to health. So those are other aspects of an energy system we want. And then finally, historically, a lot of policy on energy is not really related to making it affordable or to avoiding health and climate change. It's a deal with national security issues, and that's always part of the discussion on energy as well. And um, so it's about having access to energy and, and avoiding disruptions and then avoiding geopolitical issues as well. So that's partly what makes doing something to the energy system to address climate change difficult is that we have to somehow navigate trade-offs between finding energy systems that are cheap but may not be clean versus ones that are reliable. And so my kind of overarching motivation for the research that I do, which is on innovation in energy, is that as you can get technologies and behavior to change and improve, the trade-offs amongst these three objectives become less contentious, less confrontational. So there are solutions that can address all three of these objectives. So that's, that's kind of where I want to get to. One of the other aspects of energy that makes it difficult is there's inertia in the system. And this is 
a slide that's kind of the overarching slide in the course I teach on energy policy every fall. The transitions from one energy carrier to another, if you look historically, have been substantial and there have been multiple, but they happen really slowly. They happen over decades. So to go from an economy that was basically mainly wood-based, like 150 years ago, to one where the new energy carrier behind coal took something like 50 years, and then another 50 years to get the main energy carrier being oil. That's too slow for the types of issues that we're talking about. And let's compound that slowness with the CO2 that goes up into the atmosphere. So if we're driving our power plants and put CO2 up into the atmosphere, effectively that's up there for something like 100 years. That's really different from, say, air pollution or acid rain or particulates, dangerous pollutants as well, but ones which when it rains, a lot of that comes out of the sky and it's not there anymore. And so the chance of actually having some improvement, things can happen a lot faster. So that's another problem, another challenge with climate change is we have to somehow move even faster. That's the implication for me of these two things, of an energy system that has inertia and is slow to change, and a climate system that also is not responsive to us uh, changing what we put into the atmosphere. So that's the hard part. So I feel like in my first five years or so of teaching classes in Madison, I got really good at making those points that I just made, of talking about how kind of rigid and slow to change the energy system is, and about the science behind climate change and about how it is slow to change. And at some point, I started realizing I was doing too good a job of convincing students of those issues. And they weren't coming away encouraged or enthusiastic about addressing those, is, uh, those issues. And so I started asking myself why I continue to work on these problems when there is this kind of inherent slowness, when the climate system itself is slow, and when the political system doesn't seem to be adjusting to the urgency of the problems we face. And so what I started doing at first for myself and then for students as I started believing it myself more is to put a list together of reasons to be optimistic about doing something about climate change. And so I won't go through the whole um, list here, but just to show you that's more than one thing. So on the first one there, just to illustrate it. So there is, you know, part of the challenge was that you had to get 200 countries to agree to do something about climate change, and that seemed impossibly difficult for a really long time. Um, but then about two years ago, we had this agreement in Paris in December 2015, where we actually had some emerging collective action to do something about it. And that's certainly not sufficient to what we need to do, and what's happening on local levels and states and national governments is potentially even more important. But there is something there that wasn't there three years ago, and I think that's a really important step. And there's other of, of these that I kind of make the case or, or why they're important. Number nine there is Roy's point from this morning about um, this generation that probably has the highest stake of all the kind of active people right now. They have the highest stakes in the outcomes and do seem to be most concerned about it and not really yet most engaged, but I think there's a really chance they could become really engaged. And if they do, that's, that's really um, important and impressive. Uh, but the one I want to focus on today is another reason for optimism, is that in the background, as policymakers have been dithering about whether to do something about climate change or arguing about whether it exists or not, it's a pretty frustrating discussion to watch and observe and be kind of subject to. But on the other hand, in the background, because of the efforts of individuals, of some other governments, of companies, technology has been improving over time. And that's kind of the story I want to tell. So I really want to uh, focus on that point number eight um, on, the, on this book project and what I'll talk about today. So the first thing I'll say is that, and this is a, something that a lot of people don't understand, even if you're using data or impressions or discussions or arguments from two or three years ago, it kind of misses how inexpensive solar has become. And so I kind of want to first make that point. Um, this is, these are kind of wonky units on the horizontal or vertical axis here. It's dollars per megawatt hour. Um, the convenient thing about that unit is one megawatt hour is the average residential electricity use for a house in the US. So it's basically your household electricity bill. And that dotted line there is the average in the US. So it's about $140, $130 uh, per month. And then we can compare that to the cost of solar. And that's been dropping. So in the 1950s, it was something like, 50, it would have been $50,000 per month 
for the electricity in your house from the solar panels in the 50s. And that's been dropping uh, precipitously since then. You can see the progress until about 2008. So you can see the cost of them coming down, and here's the average of them. But that also, many of them are now what's called below grid electricity price. So it's actually cheaper for them to produce solar than it would be to buy electricity from their local provider. And this is all without subsidies. This is just the cost of solar. So you can see in the last couple of years, th something's really changed. And let me just focus on this part here. Um, so some of those dots at the bottom there, um, one is that some of the electricity contracts that are being made today are cheaper than where experts thought they would be in 2030. Even the most optimistic guess of the most optimistic expert is above what reality is today. The other thing about those two points there, uh, which should be about $18 per month for your house, that might be the cheapest way that humans have ever been able to produce electricity on a large scale. And that wasn't true five years ago. It wasn't even true three years ago. And so what's happened in solar has been really um, dramatic. So it's not just that it's so cheap now, but how far it's come. It's improved more than any other technology. So that's what I really wanted to do is answer the question of how that happened. Um, so here's the three questions I'm trying to do in my, in my book study. It's how did it become inexpensive? A second question that I think surprises a lot of people, but I think it's really important. A lot of people say, wow, solar's cheap now. That's amazing how that happened. But it's been taking a long time. And if you go back to the energy system changing and the climate system being slow to change, it's taken too long. Um, so that third question there is how can it be a model? It's not only what can we learn from solar, but how could we do it faster? How could we get some new technology or new behavioral change to get to market, become affordable, become reliable, not in the time that solar happened, but like a factor of four faster. So that, I think that's the real challenge and the policy implications uh, of this work. So I, in a lot of my work in the past, it's been you know, making, <coughs> collecting data and doing analysis, like that picture that I just showed a couple of slides ago. But I think in doing that work, I really, over like 15 years, realized there were kind of variables that I wasn't able to measure or get data on or put into regression analysis. And they were getting excluded from what people thought was important. And so this project was a way to make the description thicker by talking to people and by talking to people all around the world because the contributions to solar have really been a, a, a global development. So um, that's been a big effort in the last uh, six months is traveling around and interviewing people in you know, places like South Africa, Pakistan, going to Japan next week to try to understand how some of these things work. And it's really been eye-opening to me. I've really learned a lot that I didn't get from looking at data like this and even and reading other people's, other people's work. So that's the real effort to answer this question here. I'll give you my summary answer in uh, one slide or so. So first of all, um, the idea is that about four, maybe five important countries made distinct contributions that led to low-cost solar. And if you look at it over 70 years or so, the US was really the leader in the 1950s in developing the technology. In the 1970s, after the first oil crisis, there was a huge push on research and development, pulled a lot of people into the solar energy industry that had been working in the space program or working in high tech and devoted their efforts and their expertise to solar. Then in the 1990s, the Japanese really took the lead. They had been doing some R&D, but found these kind of unique, funny applications. So they found ways to make solar out of really thin materials that really light. And the consumer electronics companies that were really important at that time, uh, like Sharp, were making things like watches and calculators and toys, found that they could use little solar panels to fuel and power those devices that were kind of unique. And for about 20 years, until the Germans did something, that was really the market for solar, was these niche applications. And that's something that's really been important to solar because there wasn't consistent effort to sustain investments and attention on solar in any one country for the long enough that it would take. So it took these little distinct contributions. So with Japan, it was really identifying these niche markets. We're not going to change the world's energy system by electrifying or solarifying all the calculators in the world, but it kept the industry alive and it kept countries interest, companies interested in it when there wasn't a lot of other interest. But then that changed in 1998. There was an election 
in Germany, and by 2000, there was new legislation about promoting a new type of policy that would promote especially wind power. And then within a couple of years of that seeming to work pretty well, got applied to solar power. And then the market for solar power just took off by like a factor of four in one year and then just grew 30 to 50% a year after that, from 2004 to 2012. And so when I say demand pull on the bottom of that slide there in Germany, Germany created this market that before had been limited to watches and calculators. And all of a sudden, a lot of people all around the world got in, interested in supplying that market. So the Germans created a market. And then the Chinese met that demand by scaling up on, by orders of magnitude, and I'll illustrate that in a couple of minutes, in a way that was really unprecedented and was exactly what the German market uh, needed and demanded. And Australia's on there because a lot of the expertise in enabling that Chinese scale up came directly from Australia. So that's kind of the, the short answer to it. Um, of how solar got cheap and these different country contributions. One way to look at it is who led production of solar. So you can see um, the U.S. has its spike in the 1990s there. It, it, before these data were really well uh, put together, there was also a U.S. presence. But it's Japan in the 1980s and then in the 2000s. There's a little bit of Germany there. But then in this last seven or eight years, it's really China that's going to 70% of world production now. And then in installations, you can see in the middle part there, that's Germany's uh, contribution. So Japan had the biggest market in the world in the 80s and 90s. And then Germans took over, and it was all about uh, fueling the, the German market. And then interestingly, that a lot of people don't appreciate now, China's the biggest producer of solar panels in the world, and that's been true for a few years. But it's now by far the biggest installer of solar panels in the world. And that's, that's been a big change. Um, as well. So we now have strong and, and robust markets for solar. The one other point I'll make along this is I'm really talking about an international innovation system where these kind of people moving from one country to another is really what enabled a lot of this. But I think another part of solar that's made it so attractive to so many different governments in different places is there's this inherently local aspect of it. So the part I'm talking about is the hardware, um, that can be shipped around the world easily, is easily and cheaply produced in China. But there's a lot of other part, and I learned this a couple of weeks ago when I spent four hours on a Sunday putting a solar panel on my uh, camper van, is there's a, it's a lot of people with, that are roofers or electricians and trying to hook things up and connect it to the grid and getting permits for that. That's now 80% of the cost of a rooftop solar system in the U.S. And so... What I'm talking about is how that hardware part got so cheap, but this soft cost part, the roofers and the electricians, that's all local. And that's, you know, despite the rise of Chinese production taking over 70% of the world, there's more than 300,000 jobs in the solar industry now in the US, and that's what that 80% represents. So I think it's actually a really, there's something about this technology that somehow married the benefits of globalization, these gigantic global supply chains and international knowledge flows with local expertise and, you know, pretty well-paying, interesting jobs that are appealing and are, are pretty numerous if we were talking about 300,000 jobs. So I think that's part of the magic of solar is this combination of global and local. So I gave a, a summary of how solar got cheap, and I think I, I've mentioned these items uh, here. Let me just zip through. So this is where I want to spend half an hour talking about each of the next probably 10 slides. So I'll give you like a minute of a glimpse just to mention like why it's interesting. So the first solar cell, and this is kind of the, when I said why it took so long. It took so long because the first solar cell, a 6% cell, was in 1954 at, um, at Bell Lab. So that's, people thought that the uh, the idea of, of solar panels taking over was really going to happen. There was a front page article in the New York Times the day after this invention about you know, the next new energy source is solar power. It's 1954. A lot of um, the understanding of how solar panels work, it actually goes back to Einstein. I don't know if people know this, that Einstein's Nobel Prize he won in 1926 was not on the theory of relativity. It was about the photoelectric effect, this idea that when photons, like pieces of sunlight, 
interact with atoms, they can dislodge electrons and have this activation energy, and that's how solar panels work. So these guys that 50 years later created this device to actually make electricity from sunlight, we're relying on this really fundamental theoretical understanding um, that came from, from Einstein 50 years earlier than that. So there's kind of this long timelines for, for things happening with solar. I mentioned niche markets. I talked about calculators and watches. The most important early niche market was satellites. So this, the one on, the, on your left there is Sputnik. So that's what catalyzed the space race in the 1950s. And then the US launched its first satellite with solar in 1957. That's called Vanguard 2. And it was the most effective way, more effective and lighter than batteries, was to put a tiny solar panel on this. And this guy, Les Hoffman, commercialized it and started producing solar on a commercial scale and selling most of it to the US space industry. So even in the 60s, there was an emerging industry. But it wasn't about putting panels on people's rooftops and competing with coal or gas electricity. It was these niche markets. But those are really important for, for scaling up the industry. Then we had the Arab oil embargo in 1973. This big push comes from Richard Nixon and Project Independence to make the, the US have no imported oil by the end of the decade, by 1980. We didn't achieve that. But he put a lot of money into research and development. And there's this big spike that you can see on solar energy. And a lot of the technology that we had today came out of this couple of billion dollars that were spent between 1975 and 1981 when the budgets really got cut. And then this is one of my favorite interviews. Um, it took me a while to talk to Paul Maycock. He ran the, the PV program in the Department of Energy in the 1970s. It took me a while to talk because I get messages on my phone saying, Sorry, I forgot about my call. I was on the lake smoking a cigar, but hopefully you could talk to you later. So he was kind of an elusive character. And even just getting his email, I, you know, it, it was really, uh, but I finally got to talk to him, had a series of interviews with him. You know, one thing is he put together this idea of this learning curve, and that's maybe a little bit too hard to see on that, that white graph there. But he was using data from the 1960s, and in 1975 said, if solar keeps getting cheaper at this rate, it'll be affordable in the future. And so I took his graph and then I plotted where we are, where we were in 2017. And it was right on one of his curves there. Um, the only thing I would fault him is that we probably need to extend those axes further off to the right and then further down because solar is getting bigger than anyone would have suspected in 1975 and it's getting cheaper um, as well. So this idea of the technology getting better over time has really panned out. So he was an interesting person to talk to. This is one of the programs that he ran to actually purchased solar panels by the government before there was really a real market for them. That was really important. I think that's something for another technology that could really um, make a difference. There was this uh, contract in California for wind power in 1980s, and it gave people a guaranteed price that if you built a wind power plant, you would get something 10 cents per kilowatt hour for the electricity you produced. That was a really novel um, idea, and it's one that became adopted by the Germans from 1980, like 15 years later, and really created this gigantic market. So this idea of countries looking at other countries, learning from them, and it's, it's not just a coincidence. When I talked to people, they said, oh yeah, we went to California in 1985, and that seemed like a really interesting policy. We couldn't implement it in Germany because the political will wasn't there, but then it was ready. People knew about it. They had prepared some legislation, and then by 1998, when this new coalition government arose and the Green Party became part of the government, the plans were there, it had been demonstrated in California, and they really went all in on it. So there really was this kind of learning from one country uh, to another that was effective. Here's the Japanese program, I mentioned the calculators. Um, then what the Japanese did that was really novel is they had their own subsidy program, but it also had this idea that it would decline over time, that it wasn't just that you get this amount for solar, but it was going to get less and less of a subsidy each year, and they planned it out for 10 years. And that gave a lot of clear expectations that there would be a market, but also that the subsidies wouldn't last forever so that companies had to find ways to reduce the cost of solar. And you can see from that top line there, the cost really did go down. So that was a novel policy innovation by the Japanese to have these declining, uh, declining rebates. Here's a bit of the German story that, and this is one where I could talk about it for half an hour. It really comes out of the anti-nuclear protests in the 19. 80s and that renewables were seen as kind of a way to replace the nuclear power plants. And then these two policy entrepreneurs, 
uh, the top one who's no longer with us, so I couldn't interview him, but the, the bottom one I, I spoke with, really led the charge on taking that California program and then doing it in a really big way, bigger than anyone would have expected, and here's kind of the details of the policy. But they spent $200 billion subsidizing solar. And when I say they, I don't mean these two individuals. I mean, you know, the 20 or 30 million or so German households were paying a little bit more on their household electricity bills. It all added up to $200 billion and created this market. And it really reduced the cost of solar. And the Germans describe it as their gift to the world. I, I really think that is kind of how they talk about it. They really, there's some concern that now China is leading the world on production. Um, but I think that there's something to that, but there's a lot of this local aspect is still there. The Germans are creating a lot of the machines that the Chinese are buying, like on the order of 10 or $20 billion of machines a year are going to China. So it's not like the Germans really lost on it. But there's also this idea that because of this intentional policy, now the rest of the world, including Germany, including China, but other places like India and South Africa, have access to this really inexpensive solar. So that's really a big part of this story was Germany's gift to the world. But then I think the part that's maybe not uh, appreciated as much is the, the Chinese side of it, which I'm calling in my book China's own gift to the world. And they saw this opportunity, saw this market growing. And these are two of the people I interviewed. One is a professor in Australia, but then Zheng Rongxi, who for a couple of years was the richest person in China. And he became the richest person in China by creating the largest solar company in the world. And it really it's not what you hear about in the news about the government subsidizing these companies and putting tons of money on them and protecting them from losses or giving them cheap loans. It, it was incredibly entrepreneurial. He was going around the world buying secondhand equipment from all the people he knew in Germany and the US, working 16 hours a day, training the workers, negotiating contracts and trying to just continually get the cost to go down. And at the same time, try to make a, a low cost product. And I think that's really a, it's a story of entrepreneurship in China that today I think is really, when I went to China a month or so ago, I felt it all around me, is that these people, a lot of people there just have this idea that you can start a business or you can make an attempt to do something and try to make it really big. And so this is what they did. They started with $5 million, scoured the world for used equipment, they were making a premium product, so a very high efficiency product, but they could do it really cheaply. I spent a lot of time in Germany. Germans are very skeptical of, I, I guess, a lot of things, but they're also very um, proud of their innovation and engineering prowess. And one of the ways that this Chinese company was able to sell into this German market was to say, these are the most efficient cells in the world. This is not something that's junk and just cheap. It's reliable and super high quality. And the, Germans really appreciated that, and that's how they got into the market. They built a supply chain, they trained the workforce. Like I said, the money originally came from angel investors and some of these entrepreneurs themselves, but the big money that really scaled up this company came from pension funds in the US that were investing in the stock market, and the biggest IPOs in 2005 to 2007 were these solar companies in China. Like two things, solar is the future and China is the future. So you had tens of billions of dollars uh, going to Chinese companies that were from pension funds in the US, and these Chinese companies were using a lot of it to buy equipment from Germany to bring to their factories in China and then sell uh, solar panels and install them all over the world, a lot in Germany, but then in other places as well. So it's a really a, a global flow of, of funds for that. And what they did, in a way, I mean, the question I have for the Japanese and the Germans when I've been doing these interviews is, why couldn't you guys scale up? You were closer to the markets, you had more historical lead in the technology, closer to the supply chain, you knew all the machine manufacturers. They just um, didn't have the willingness to take the risk to scale up by a factor of 10 or whatever it would take. And I think that, that's something that the Chinese had, this appetite for risk that the, uh, the Japanese and the Germans and the US didn't have. Um, yeah, and then later on the government supported it, but that was a later thing. So let me just make this point about um, scale for a minute, because I, it's a kind of a lot to put on one slide, and the scales are so different that I had to put it on a logarithmic scale, and that's a, a pretty wonky thing, but the idea is that for each of these labels on the left, it's up by a factor of 10. So it's not just going up from one to 100 on the top, it's going from one to 10 to 100, 
one gigawatt's 1,000, then it's 10,000, then 100,000. So we're talking about like five orders of magnitude on this. The yellow line is the world market for solar, and then this gray background is the largest company each of these times. And just to show you how much bigger the production has gotten, so if we start out, that's the Arco Solar. That was a leader in the US in the 1980s and 1990s. So they were the biggest company for a while. Then I mentioned Sharp. They scaled up. So Japan had the biggest company in the 2000s. Then the Germans had one called Q-Cells that scaled up and was big for a couple of years. Then this one that I've been talking about is Suntech. So then they scaled up <coughs> even bigger. And it looks like they're just beating the other ones. But you know, they're going by like a factor of 10 in a lot of these cases, bigger. And then now we've got all the uh, ones came after SunTech, so these other companies, they're giant. And to try to put it into perspective, I kind of, this is where my grad students really kind of came through. I was saying, this is, I hate doing logarithmic scales because it doesn't really adjust to most people's perception of how numbers work. And how do you compare what was happening in the 80s to now? So one thing we try to do is to say, okay, take one of these factories, how many roofs could you cover with solar panels uh, from one year's production from one of these factories? So that's what we did. We're going to focus on Wisconsin. We pick a neighborhood, maybe one that the professor lives on. I don't, I don't know. But, um, <laughs> so in 1980, Arco Solar could cover all the houses on my block with solar panels. By the late 1980s, it was kind of the few blocks around me could be covered by the biggest company, biggest solar company in the world. By 1997, we were talking about a big chunk of the west side of Madison. That was kind of Arco Solar's last big production year. Then by 2002, we were looking at almost most of the population of Madison could be covered in solar by Sharp uh, with their production in 2002. Then if we go to SunTech, when they were at their peak, we were talking about all of Dane County. All the houses and buildings in Dane County could be covered by solar panels with one year's production from SunTech. And then if you look at it today, and actually I updated these numbers, so it's really from a year ago, we could do not the whole state of Wisconsin, but we could do the lower half of Wisconsin by the production from just one of these factories um, in China now. And then if, you, if I updated it for the data that I just got for 2017, it would be the whole state of Wisconsin. It's, that's not, that's just for one, factory, and there's you know, 10, 10 of those or so for the whole uh, solar industry. So the scale is now really big and getting bigger, and that's led to things getting, uh, getting cheaper. So that's a big part of, uh, part of the story. Um, these are just some of the, you know, I looked into what actually is changing to get the cost down, so things like silicon price, wafers getting thinner. Um, here's what a factory in China looks like, and it's... One thing you notice is how many people you see around this factory. There's not a lot. So when we talk about solar jobs and solar manufacturing, I get much more excited about the 300,000 people that are installing solar panels in the US, much less interested in the 20 or so people that comes to maintain these, uh, these machines and make sure the utilities are working and things like that. I think that's, that's where the action is in terms of uh, employment and, and local benefits. Um, so this was China's own benefit to the world, and I think what it is in terms of a benefit is, you know, now we are talking about the possibility of fueling 30 to 50 percent of the world's energy supply, you know, within a couple of decades by solar. And, you know, even 10 years ago, that would have been, it was, it was ridiculed as something that's just not possible, completely infeasible and definitely unaffordable. And now this is not us projecting what we want. This is an integrated assessment model, which is basically allocating the cheapest and most effective way to produce electricity. And now we're talking about potentially having a third to a half of energy supply um, from solar. So that's, that's come a long way. What I'd like to do just in the last few minutes here is talk about how we could learn from solar and what we could do with it. Um, so we've got aspects of what made solar work. There's a bunch of other technologies that we might uh, want to apply solar to. Some of these are pretty obscure and maybe new to a lot of you. It's something I've been spending a lot of time on lately. I'll just mention a couple of them. So direct air carbon capture, so taking CO2 out of the atmosphere and putting it underground, that's a new technology. Small modular nuclear reactor, so not what we're used to thinking about with nuclear, but something much um, smaller scale that had to be more uh, flexible and safer.
Batteries are already happening, so that's not a model that we need. But then I think there are other technologies that I think could be important, but they couldn't learn from the solar model. So having power plants where you capture the carbon that's coming out of the flue gas and put it somewhere, that's a really different type of challenge. And similar to large nuclear putting solar panels in space, I don't know if people have heard of solar radiation management, that's something other things that people are talking about. I think that's where you need some other kind of model than what solar has worked for. I think these ones on the left, though, could really benefit from what we learned about what made solar work. Then there's other technologies, technologies maybe in a, in a softer way, um, that also could be really important, but they're different. They're very small, very distributed, often very low technology. So, you know, we could potentially put like a gigaton or more, billion tons or more of carbon from the atmosphere and just store it in soils by doing pretty simple things, by having cover crops instead of bare soil, and by doing low-till planting instead of digging up and plowing a, a whole field. It's, it's amazing, and to think about the cost of that, there's actually not cost. It's more of a behavioral change and an appetite for risk that would drive it. So that's a really different type of model. So that's something that, as I'm working on, how do we deal with climate change? How do we promote technologies for climate change? I think there's types of technologies that are high technology, there's a lot of small, repetitive processes, like solar, that's the iterative, and that are disruptive, that somehow you can do it cheaply and it actually works really well. So this air capture, that's the acronym there. Solar is a good model for that. Other technologies, I think of soils, they're low tech, they're super distributed. So it's not like 10 companies in the world making solar panels, it's millions and millions of farmers deciding how they're gonna plant their seeds and what they're going to plant and whether they use cover crops. That sounds like not so much a solar model, but something about how hybrid seeds um, got distributed and how agricultural yields uh, improved in the Green Revolution. Then you have large scale processes like these industrial facilities. So um, when we talk about capturing carbon at power plants, I think you have to learn more from what we've done and know how to do in the chemical industry or refineries. Um, and then there's other, other technologies as well, um, like maybe artificial intelligence can actually be uh, relevant for some of these climate, climate issues as well. Okay, so I guess I'll just close um, by answering or asking this question um, because I think there's a need not just to find models but find ways to make them work faster. Um, it took a long time. So this is kind of the share of electricity generation coming from solar and so for the world it's about one and a half percent now and that's one of those numbers that's almost doubling every year, and so people say, well, it's a rounding error solar. And you could have said that three years ago, um, but a couple years ago it was 1%, and now it's closer to 2%, and it's growing at 30, 50% a year. So there is something real to it. And then some of these places that have gone big, like Germany and Japan, um, have substantial amounts of solar, but even China, which has got this gigantic energy system, is now close to 2% on solar. So this looks pretty positive, and looks like we're going in the right direction. What I try to caution people about is this has not all happened in the last 10 years. This starts with Einstein, or at least with that first satellite in 1957. So if we're in 1954 and the New York Times says solar energy is the future, and now it's pretty convincing in 2018 that it is, that took too long. So I, I guess my motivation now is to think of, if we're using it as a model, how could we speed it up? And this is kind of what where I'm heading to in the rest of, the, of my book project as I finish up the interviews and start putting it together, how could we make some of these technologies do what solar did but happen faster so that they're actually relevant and useful for climate change? Because we don't have 70 years or whatever it took for solar to start deploying these on a big affordable scale and they may come in that time but that's not useful for climate change. We need something much uh, quicker. So some of the Possibilities are uh, R&D funding that seems to be important in all of these places. Even in China, which has adopted a lot of knowledge and information from other places, having its own R&D over many years seems to have helped. Early stage procurement, so creating a new market. So governments putting solar panels on buildings has been important in solar, um, but we could think about doing that in other areas as well. When the market is, when the technology is still unreliable, unproven, and you need someone to take a risk on it, Governments can do that and be the early adopters of it. Workforce training seems to be really important. That's connected to education. Preserving knowledge, so how these things work, the know-how, that seems to be really important. And with solar, which I don't think is unique, 
the market for solar has gone up and down. It's been boom and bust. It's been booming lately, but people thought it was booming in the 50s, and they thought it was booming in the 70s, and then they thought it was booming 15 years ago in Germany, and that eventually stopped. You see this policy volatility almost everywhere. And so the challenge is, how do you preserve the industry, the knowledge that's embodied in the machines and people's activities when there's a downturn and when people flee the industry, like they did in the, in the US in the 1980s? How do you preserve knowledge? That's important. Part of the answer is codifying it, so making sure it's captured somewhere. And for me, is making sure that it's public so that people have access to it. It's not just hidden and considered proprietary. Spillover opportunities, so solar learned a lot from the computer industry. So finding ways for one technology or one industry to adopt practices, to use equipment from other areas. Solar benefits so much from companies that were making semiconductors when that industry was growing rapidly. And so if we're thinking about other technologies, those are opportunities we should look for. Robust markets, so the idea there is that markets really matter, I've tried to make that point, but also that they come and go. Oil prices go up and down, electricity prices go up and down. If we're talking in a climate policy context, carbon prices can go up and down, they can be volatile. So how do you create markets that are robust enough, that'll be there even when there's a change, and so production can continue, people can still work in the industry? That's been important. For solar, part of it is that there were different countries in the world subsidizing solar at different times. First it was the US, then it was Japan, then it was Germany, it was Spain for a couple of years, it was Italy for a couple of years. Then when all of those dried up during the global financial crisis, China said, now it's our turn, and they were really smart about it. They started creating this gigantic market. When the other markets had gone away, that was a way to preserve their industry, but they also did it at a time when solar had gotten so cheap that it wasn't that expensive to do that. So those robust markets were really helpful for solar and I think would be helpful for other technologies as well. The global capabilities part is just the amount of people moving around the world, going to conferences, having kind of interesting interactions and then bringing it back with them. Someone from Exxon going to visit Japan in the 1960s and seeing Japan had these lighthouses with solar batteries on them. And then Exxon starts using them on their oil rigs as navigation aids. That was an interesting, important new niche market. So this global capability seemed to be really important. Um, and then the trade in the, in the goods that moved around, I think of the German machines being made in Germany or in Switzerland and then going to China, that was crucial for transferring the knowledge. The people moving around, that's been incredibly, I mean, in my book, I spent a lot of time talking about this guy who became the richest person in China, ended up going to university in Australia. He was supposed to go to do a PhD in the US, but for some reason, he only got funding to go to Australia, went there, met this PV researcher there, and then went back to China with that knowledge and then started the biggest company uh, in the world. And then the finally, um, I think this is an important one, I and mean, this is on kind of academic jargon, political economy accommodations. But the idea there is that there are strong entrenched interests that may not have a stake in the progress and the development of this technologies. And I think it's important to somehow address that and be aware of it and know that even if solar is cheap and clean and reliable now, that I think that's really good for the world, but not every interest group in the world benefits from having solar being cheap, clean, and reliable. So somehow making accommodations for that. And there's a, a variety of ways that you could do that, but just ignoring it, which I think the solar industry has done a lot of, um, I think tends to slow things down. So if we want to speed things up, we have to take those political realities uh, into account. And um, I think there's some difficult decisions to make about that. So this is kind of emerging ideas that have come from doing all these uh, interviews. But I'll stop there and happy to take any uh, questions before the break. <laughs>